Hello, my name is Mike Gaben, and welcome to my KSP campaign. Oh, it's deja vu all over again as I'm here with the Moho 3 performing a 46 meter per second correction burn. And no, I didn't accidentally start this episode with the exact same maneuver you saw last episode. But it is very, very familiar. Last episode, you saw me doing very similar burn to this one a correction burn except this one was setting up an eve flyby that was last episode and my idea was to do an e flyby and then get myself to moho where i would need to do a capture and then get back to Kerbin. um the problem was is in order to get that moho capture on this go around i required a three kilometer per second burn at eve or else i wasn't going to get that moho encounter at all and that you know, that's pretty expensive and made sort of accomplishing what this thing needs to accomplish uh well a little bit dubious and it was only after the fact that i started thinking and i went you know there's no rule that says that moho 3 has to encounter moho this turn around on this particular orbit about the sun so what this burns done is it took away that eve flyby so now i'm not going to fly by eve no big deal there. Actually, I have a crewed mission on its way to Eve that you will be seeing actually later this episode. What I do need to do now, though, is do a phasing burn down at periapsis with the sun in order to get my moho encounter on the subsequent orbit. And that came out to be about 2100 meters per second. Cheaper than the 3 kilometer per second burn I had before. And also, this should make my subsequent burn with moho pretty cheap at least definitely a lot cheaper than the previous uh mission that i had planned but i'm not coming to that maneuver for another hundred days so hopefully we're saying goodbye to the moho 3 for a while let's get ourselves to something new sitting on the pad here we have the arm e2 and it's on its way hopefully to capture us a d-class asteroid and i say hopefully because Oh my goodness, I'm almost, there's got to be a jinx on this mission because this is the fourth vessel to attempt to try and pull this one off. The first time, it was attempted by the Arm D. Uh, the Arm D, actually, this first attempt was my closest attempt. I mean, at least this thing got to the asteroid and got itself uh, back into Kerbin's SOI. But I tried to do a little bit of arrow breaking to try to felicitate my capture. And, uh, well, I found out that an asteroid doesn't make as effective a heat shield as I had hoped. So then it was on to the Arm D2, which suffered this spectacular explosion when a strutting glitch reared its head shortly after launch. The mission then went to bed for a little while until the Arm E came along only a couple of episodes ago but it suffered a communication failure once it left Kerbin's sphere of influence, thanks to my ineptitude with metrics prefixes. So here we are with the Arm E2. I am estimating the incoming trajectory of the asteroid to be about an inclination of 48 degrees. So I'm launching into an inclination to match that, as well I'm launching at a time so that I'll be following that trajectory out of Kerbin's SOI. That should help facilitate the rendezvous and make the rendezvous work out that much easier. While we talk a little bit about what else is coming up in this episode, I've already mentioned actually that we'll be dropping in on our crew that is on its way to Eve, and in addition we'll also be dropping in on our crew that are on their way to Drez. Yeah, we have reasons to uh, visit both of them in this episode, but mostly we'll be spending our time putting that ore that we have harvested to some use and get some crude exploration of the surface of the moon going in a little bit more earnestly, I think, than I've had it happening in the past. Once LKO was established, a 950 meter per second prograde burn got me a close approach of about 2200 kilometers in 13 days. We won't be needing to make any further adjustments until we're out of Kerbin's SOI, but that's going to have to wait until next episode. In the meantime, let's get ourselves over to the moon. 
where we'll join Burrick and Wilman, whom at the end of the last episode we saw leaving the moon's sphere of influence with this huge bounty of ore hooked to the front of the Karanian Three, And that was in order to fulfill a requirement to put uh, a ton of ore. I don't know, I'm not talking literally a ton. It might be literally a ton. I don't know. It's more than a ton. <laughs> but a whole lot of ore in orbit about Kerbin. But I didn't want to put the ore to waste. And I wanted to get back to the moon. So uh, Burrick and Wilman, they've done a couple of orbits of Kerbin. And now they are back. At the moon, more specifically, are, they are back at the moon harvester, and we're going to redock, get this ore starting into the refining process so we can hopefully make a little bit of use out of it. Oh man, this thing is sluggish to say the least. And that has definitely everything to do with this huge quantity of ore stuck to the front of the vessel. I've actually disabled the main reaction wheels that are in behind the hitchhiker can. And the only reaction wheels I have going are the hitchhiker or the reaction wheels that are in the command capsule towards the front there because those are far closer to where the actual center of mass of this thing now is with all the ore at the front of it. So I have to put on the RCS now and again just to help with attitude control. And with both reaction wheels going, I'd get this uh this crazy wobble going across that docking port, which which wasn't good and would definitely make this docking very difficult. Even with this, it was still pretty tedious, so I had to get in. It was all doable, but it was tedious and slow, so why don't we just get ourselves over to the actual docking here? There we go. And I thought right off the bat, why don't we turn on the harvester, the uh, Convertitron, that's the word I was looking for, and actually create some monopropellant and top up the monopropellant tanks on the Karayan 3 because I have used more monopropellant than I normally would because of my heavy use of RCS. But otherwise, the Karayan 3, you know, is doing pretty good as far as resources goes and uh, has plenty of liquid fuel, more than it needs. So what I did is I undocked pretty much right away. I'm going to leave the harvester back just doing its job making liquid fuel and oxidizer to support some moon missions and then we'll get the Karayan 3 back to Shellcal in Yoi Station. Shellcal's been on his own for about 10 days so we should be getting back to him. Now Yoi Station is in about identical in orbit to the orbit we are in now so getting back to it was all pretty easy and routine and now without that huge mass of ore sticking at the front of it the Karayan 3 was once again, it's old, lovely, maneuverable self. There we go. Now the plan was to bring the harvester this way next, and then to take our lander, the Kegel 4, and dock it with the harvester and fill up the Kegel 4 so that we can do a moon landing. But it turned out that the RMB, which is what brought over the second asteroid, is still attached to the second asteroid, had still quite a lot of liquid fuel and oxidizer left aboard after completing its mission to bring over this asteroid, and it turned out it was more than enough to refill up our lander, the Kegel 4. Now I do have a contract still to investigate an anomaly on the surface, and when I took a look at map view here, it turned out that that anomaly was due to pass below us in just a little bit over an hour, it looked like. So, like, hell, let's get this show on the road. Yeah, it's looking like our anomaly is right in the center of this big crater that's coming up. You can see we got Shell Cal along. Shell Cal is more than happy to get his legs stretched. He needs to get out of that science lab that I've had him cooped up in for way too long. It's looking like I got this lined up pretty good. That is partially thanks to ScanSat. ScanSat is great for uh, helping to pick which orbit it is that you need to begin your descent on and of course the Trajectories mod for providing this nice red X. Predicting, well at the time this shot's being taken, an impact site, not a landing site, but it certainly helps you line these things up and it really does help put you the put these things right down onto the money. Unfortunately, this crater is one of the Midland craters, and we have landed in Midland craters before, so there is not much science to get. 
Either way, well, EVA shall Cal get... Oh, oh, message from Mortimer. Well, this seems rather mundane. I'm not sure it was worth all the funds it took to get you here. Funds? What funds? We're reusing a vessel, and even the fuel is left over from another mission. Oh, man, you cheap bastard, Mortimer. Anyway, we'll get Shell Cal here to plant a flag right on top of the monolith. Okay, message time. The Kegel 4, Shell Cal, Burrick, and Wilman. Ooh, I think this may be the last of these. And by that, I mean the monoliths. It certainly feels like we visited a lot of the monoliths. Something tells me that there's still lots more out there. Alright, now. Not a lot of science here, so we're going to pick another place to go. Where should we go next? Ooh, the Northern Basin. That's attractive. It's got 10% ore concentration, which seems to be the highest concentration on the moon. And we've never been to the Northern Basin before, so there'll be lots of science to get. And I briefly considered doing a hop. It's pretty much just due north of where I am. But that would likely leave me without enough fuel to obtain an orbit. Now I can land the harvester, and in which case I'll have as much fuel as I will ever need, but what if something went wrong during the lander, uh, landing of the harvester? We got limited life support on the Kegel. No, I, I think we would be in trouble if that would happen. So I think the safer thing to do is to head back to the station which, where we can do some restocking there and then we'll get ourselves back down. Station, of course, is in a polar orbit. But it, that orbit has moved westward while we've been sitting on the surface. Or actually, more properly, of course, the moon has rotated eastward. So I ended up aiming towards the west to try and facilitate the two orbits crossing. Which was, after finishing this all off, I realized was completely <laughs> unnecessary. Uh, orbits are going, the planes of orbits are going to cross regardless of the direction in which I launch. So this is actually only making the relative inclinations of the two orbits uh, higher, which is going to just increase the cost of the rendezvous. I should have just gone straight north. But it was on my way to that rendezvous burn when I got this message. Kermes won. Food depleted. What? How can they be out of food? That can't be. They should have tons of food. I mean, those folks are on their way to Drez. If they're running out of life support, they're done. Let's jump out there. Let's see here. There they are. Kermes won. Okay, jump to ship. And let's look in and see what's going on here. Okay, checking resources. There's tons of food here. Let's check in on the uh, TAC life support monitor. Where is it? Here it is. One year, 297 days. Okay, I guess they're fine. <laughs> I suppose that was a false alarm. I'm not sure quite what triggered it. Uh, let's just actually check on these folks while we are here. The rotation is being provided by the persistent rotation mod. We'll put it on lock view because it makes it easier to click on things. Okay, the main life support stuff here is over by the hitchhiker can. Yeah, tons and tons there. And there we go. Oh, that's interesting. There was no CO2 and almost no wastewater. And that's because I have tech here that uses those waste products. Where are they? Oh, the lab module light is off. Okay, let's turn the light on. Okay, uh, sorry, just got distracted there for a little bit. Where? Oh, oh, here we are. This is a carbon extractor. Takes the CO2, extracts the carbon, and produces O2. It's obviously doing its job. Notice that it can actually hold some CO2. Oh, and in here we have a water purifier which takes wastewater and changes it into potable water. Both of these, by the way, use electricity, so you have to make sure that you provide enough electricity. Why don't we actually notice that there's a wastewater container? Why don't we transfer some of that wastewater over there? I used to actually get worried that you needed to keep that wastewater container and the CO2 container on the other one uh, full, or else these... Um, two devices will shut down but that's obviously not the case it'll just start using those waste products from other containers 
we know that because the CO2 on this thing, there was no CO2 left. So obviously the carbon extractor is certainly doing its job. You may recall that uh, actually this ship, it is on its way to Dres, like I mentioned, but it is rather fuel starved. Uh, getting these folks back home could be a challenge, but that's going to have to obviously be for a future episode. Why don't we get ourselves back to the moon? Where you may be noticing that this isn't Yoy Station. <laughs> no, it is not. I uh, changed my mind <laughs> and, and changed my target. My original thought was I was going to go to Yoy Station and then I was going to bring the Moon Harvester over to Yoy Station and then have the Kegel dock with the Moon Harvester and that will use the Moon Harvester's resources to top up all its fuel supplies. And then I thought, why am I doing this this way? <laughs> Why don't I just cut to the chase and head just straight for the harvester? Now, it turned out I'd already actually missed a transfer window to the harvester, so it ended up taking an extra day or so to get here. Uh, but there's still another seven days, about a seven days of life support left in the Kegel, so that should be plenty to get down to the surface one more time. And then we'll go back to the station, and then we'll top up the life support. I'll tell you, though, this playing around, not to mention the pretty crappy ascent that I had that I've already explained, left this vessel a little fuel starved i mean we got here obviously but uh, if you take a look at kerbal engineer and what it's telling me i have a whole one meter per second of liquid fuel and oxidizer left at this point so i completed the docking transferred over the fuel the uh, harvester had made tons of it by this point but it turned out this was a day for checking in on my interplanetary missions yeah, here we have the kermes too my other interplanetary crewed mission. These folks are on their way to EVE, and I just deactivated the rotation. Which, by the way, did get kind of messed up, because you can see it's kind of going all over the place, and that's because the uh, control point got, it got confused. <laughs> it happens sometimes. So we need to get this onto its maneuver node, because we're about to perform a bit of a correction burn to tweak our encounter with EVE. But once we had this all settled out, it was just a matter of time warping to our burn. Whoa! Oh my god, look at the bat ball! What the heck? And all the life support's gone. Ah! It looks like a docking port, but it's it's gone crazy. Okay, well back at the tracking station. Oh, we have multiple parts here. Escape trajectory, suborbital. Oh, well, this looks like an escape trajectory too. It uh, looks like the ship just flew apart. Okay, I'm not sure what happened there, but luckily I had a recent save. And this time I thought I'd just keep an eye on the ship. And see if we can figure out what's going on here. Just waiting for it to render again. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Do you see this? It's Everything's oriented vertically. How the heck? Oh, and now... Okay, now it exploded. And now I got the same thing I had before. All the pieces, their orientation was like vertical. What on earth is going on? Well, I reverted once again. And I started suspecting persistent rotation. I noticed this, this reference, from a reference sun. Okay, relative rotation. All right, we got this new menu. There's this unset option. Yeah, let's try unset. Okay, well, I don't know. <laughs> I hope, I, I, I mean, I was really worried at this point that I wasn't gonna be able to figure this out because if I couldn't figure this out, I was just gonna have to call this mission lost, like that these folks all died because of a software problem or something like that. Uh, but it seemed to you know, if I time warp while the rotation was going, you can see here, there, there doesn't seem to be any issue. So what I did is I time warped until I was close to the burn without affecting the rotation. And then, once I got close to the burn, I stopped the rotation and oriented myself onto the maneuver node, but then did no more time warping. And, well, here goes the burn. Everything seemed to be okay here. So I'm not quite sure if it was my time warping or maybe just that unsetting the sun as the reference frame seemed to fix it. I, I can't say what the answer to that is, but they seem to be okay for now. 
We'll check in on them again, of course, in a future episode. Why don't we get ourselves back to the moon, and we'll stay there this time. And we are going for that northern basin that we are eyeing earlier this episode. And actually, shortly after undocking, I went back to the harvester. And the harvester has a ton of fuel, because it can keep making fuel as long as it has ore, and it still has quite a lot of ore. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the plane of the harvester eastward. Because what I'd like to do after landing the Kegel is land the harvester in the same spot. So this will give me some time to get the Kegel down and then I can wait for the moon to rotate a little bit more. And we are coming down here into the northern basin. You can see that it is nighttime. But that shouldn't be a problem because we are equipped with a fuel cell on this vessel so we shouldn't have any electricity issues. And there we are. And once we get the harvester down we shouldn't have any fuel issues either. But it turned out getting that harvester down was a little bit more of an adventure than I anticipated. Now I'll be the first to admit these precision landings I, I'm not that good at this stuff. I am not that great of a pilot. I have landed this thing before, but never as precisely as what I'm trying to do right now. And also this thing still has quite a lot of ore on it, so it's a lot heavier. Especially up towards the top, it's actually quite top heavy. And so that's making this a little bit of an extra challenge. Well, here it seems like I'm coming close. Let's try and just get it down and then we'll assess the situation and oh wait 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 no it's falling over uh, get out of here. So I uh, fought with this for a little bit and then finally just realized like what the heck am I doing why am I trying to precisely maneuver this big heavy awkward vehicle let's just get this down to the surface and maneuver over the far more nimble Kegel now if you look to the left there you'll notice that I already have a Kerbinoth down there on the surface that is Wilman our engineer once I got about 50 meters away from the harvester I uh, EVA'd Wilman and he is marking how far one of those KIS fuel pipes will stretch. <laughs> so I need to get within that distance in order to uh, be able to hook these two vessels together and transfer resources back and forth. Oh I say I'm, I'm there now. Let's put her down. Okay, that'll do it. I think I think I'm close enough. So let's get over to Wilman. There he is, Wilman. And then Wilman's going to use the Kerbal Inventory System slash Kerbal Attachment System fuel pipes, where I happen to have a couple of pipe endpoints already on the harvester, because I was already thinking I'd probably end up doing something like this. And we'll hook those two things together, and then we'll start drilling, and we'll start refining, and we'll, we'll get going. But Wilman right now, oh my gosh, he is having himself a ball. This is what he lives for. He's working in a coal mine, going down, down. Working in a coal mine. Oops, I'm going to slip. You know what? It's too bad Jeb's not here. Jeb was here, he'd have a better song to sing. Come listen to my story about a man named Jeb. Poor Kerber not barely kept his crew fed. And then one day he was shooting for some food. When up from the ground came a bubbling crude. Or that is black gold Kerbal tea. Yeah, I am that old. <laughs> so we'll get the whole harvesting processing happening. We'll fuel the Kegel back up. I got about five days to get these folks back to the station before they start to run out of life support, but I don't think that should be a problem. But I think that's going to have to be for the next episode. In the meantime, I thank you for watching, and hope to see you again next time. Said an equatorial launch site is the place you ought to be, so he loaded up the truck and he moved to the KSC. Space Center, that is. Rocket ships. Delta V.